the same thing. So there's a direct link between perception and action. Perceiving what others do in their group creates a tendency in themselves to do the same thing. Now, you may have heard of this uh, in, other, in other domains, uh, for example, mirror neurons. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that, well, maybe people are the same way. Uh, and, you know, there's some evidence that uh, even little guys, you know, imitate the, the big guys around them. And, you know, this is natural for kids because they're soaking up what the right thing to do is. They don't know the norms. They don't know what's right or wrong and safe and unsafe yet. And so they're really looking at the big people to get cues about what to do and soaking those up. So just like these guys, these guys, you know, are also doing the same kind of thing. So you have this principle lots, uh, lots of places in psychology. William James called it the principle of ideomotor action. For James, it was conscious thought, however. Thinking about doing something makes it more likely you'll do it, just merely thinking about it. We have a lot of, uh, you know, history of research. Uh, the Gestaltist, Kohler, Kafka, others, you know, in the 20s. Uh, mimicry imitation, you got uh, the, the work uh, more recently, um, uh, Meltzoff and other people uh, showing uh, 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 imitation even in newborn infants uh, right off the bat of crying of other infants uh, makes them more likely to cry. And you've got Giacomo Rizzolatti and, uh, and uh, others and his colleagues uh, more recent research on mirror neurons and how that supports theory of mind. Essentially that witnessing, uh, and this is in monkeys as well as people, but witnessing a behavior in a uh, conspecific uh, or actually in the case of the monkey research, a human experimenter, actually activates the same tendency to do the same thing yourself. In other words, it activates areas of the premotor cortex, staging areas for, for actually behaving yourself. And so obviously that's a support for the kind of finding uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, in the more social psychological domain. Uh, if you have people interact with each other on a task where they're working on a, something on the table and talking about it, but not really looking at each other too much and, and just really working on the same task on the table, we can set that up so a confederate is playing the role of the other participant in that paradigm. And the confederate is either rubbing uh, her face or, or, in another version, shaking her foot. The actual participant uh, uh, does this task with one and then the other in a counterbalanced order. And you find when they're with the face-rubbing uh, confederate, they're rubbing their own face much more. And when they're with the foot-shaking confederate, they stop rubbing their face so much and they start shaking their foot a lot more. And now people, when, when you tell them about this in these experiments, usually don't believe you that this is not what they were doing. And then it's, uh, often our participants ask to see the videotape of themselves doing it. We could you know, show it to them and they could see. Uh, this is something we all do, uh, not just participants in psychology experiments, um, and I do it too, and everybody does it. It's just a very natural tendency because of perception in, uh, activating the tendency, uh, the, the representations to do the same thing yourself. So it's a very natural social phenomenon in lots of different animals. And in social psychology, we know, however, that uh, perception is not just merely perceiving what's going on right now in the environment. It's not just physical information about, you know, shake, uh, foot shaking or face rubbing, but we, all, we often go beyond the information given in our perception. So, for example, when we perceive a member of, of, of uh, minority groups or, or certain groups in society, we stereotype them. We have content added to uh, what's, what's out there in the environment. But assumptions and expectations based on group membership, for example, that's going beyond the information given in Jerome Bruner's famous phrase. Uh, so, well, what that suggests is that maybe uh, it's not just uh, physical uh, you know, perception of, of what's going on right now in the environment that causes these effects on behavior, but also trait concepts and stereotypes, if activated in the course, automatically in the course of uh, social perception, they too would proceed on and affect your own behavior. Uh, now, it's not out there, but it's activated in here, and that might have the same effect. So we can extend uh, these uh, perception behavior effects to stereotypes and trait concepts. For example, the first one we picked on was the, con was the uh, elderly stereotype. Uh, this is an actual street sign from London, uh, England. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, but I'm hoping there's not like 20 points or something like underneath this. You know, like uh, the idea here is to watch out and be careful. Uh, these uh, old people are, over, are bent over and slow and walking with canes. Um, it's an actual street sign. Um, and, and so the stereotype of, old peop of older people or elderly people as being physically slow and weak uh, is certainly a very strong uh, stereotype uh, in lots of societies. Uh, and so what we first did was to uh, prime the elderly stereotype, uh, activate it with aspects of it like Florida, bingo, oranges, but also... <laughs> gray and conservative and things like that in what's called a scrambled sentence test, and I'll show you that later, but verbally. Uh, and these were 19, 18, 19-year-old 19 NYU students. They weren't older people. Uh, and we did that, and then we just measured. Now, the, the key thing about our priming with, with activating the concept is we did not have anything in our primes having to do with slowness or weakness. And we're trying to show people go beyond the information we present them. We didn't prime slowness or weakness. We just primed the idea of elderly people 
but because the stereotype contains it, we assumed slowness and weakness would be active, and that would cause a person to be slow or weak, and that's what we found. So what you, what you get in both of these uh, experiments is the, the people primed with the elderly stereotype, and of course I used gray bars here, um, are, are actually walking down the hall, leaving the experiment more slowly than people who are in the, in the control condition who are not primed with the elderly stereotype. Now, that's a 1996 finding. Since then, there's been dozens, if not hundreds, of demonstrations of stereotype priming effects, and you get them for you know, so many different things. Uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, for example, activating the nurse, uh, the, a stereotype of a nurse uh, makes people more helpful afterwards. Uh, activating the, the stereotype of a politician causes people to be, be more verbose. They talk longer and write longer after you prime the idea of a stereotype. Um, if you uh, activate the idea of uh, or prime people with German shepherds, they're more loyal to their group in, in group, uh, out group kinds of experiments afterwards. Uh, and uh, the first one by Dijksterhaus and Van Knippenberg uh, up there in the upper left, if you prime the idea of professor, uh, people do better on trivial pursuit questions. <laughs> Except sports. The, so the hooligans... The hooligans over there in the upper right do better on the sports questions, but they do worse on everything else. Now, they're not hooligans. They're not anything. These are just people like you and me. But the idea has been activated of a soccer hooligan studied in Holland or professor or so forth. So these are people like you and me, and this is what happens when these concepts are activated. So this is a pretty ubiquitous effect and pretty pervasive effect. You don't get it just with aspects of people or types of people. You get it with aspects of situations. For example, contextual cues, uh, a hippie-type backpack, the study done in Stanford, um, uh, in, a, in a room causes people to be more cooperative in a prisoner's dilemma game afterwards. Study Aaron Kay and uh, Lee Ross and I did, uh, Kristen Wheeler a long time ago. Uh, and if, a, if it's a briefcase uh, in the same place against the door of the room, people are more competitive in a prisoner's dilemma game. And the mere object of, here's my backpack back here, but you know, a backpack or a briefcase and the door, uh, by the door is all it takes to produce these significant differences in cooperation or competition. Uh, it has health, these, these effects have health implications. Uh, uh, Jennifer Harris, who's now working with Kelly Brownell at the Rudd Center of uh, Research on Obesity and Eating Disorders at Yale. She was a, a graduate student in my lab. And we started looking at the effects of television ads. These are cues, repetitive cues uh, in TV ads and how that would directly affect a person's eating behavior. So we had people watch a five-minute comedy show that had naturally in it food ads or not. We actually looked at healthy versus unhealthy types of food, like Cashy versus McDonald's. Uh, that didn't make any difference, interestingly. Uh, but they were food ads or not. And then we had a bowl of goldfish crackers and a water thing for them to, while they're watching, just you know, if they wanted any. They didn't tell them to eat, but we just had that there for them. And we just looked to see how much they ate. And these were 8-year-old kids and college students and 40- or 50-year-old adults in these various studies. And the presence of the food ads in the clip increased the consumption of, of uh, goldfish crackers by 45%. So... You know, my message to people is this. Um, uh, these guys and these ads, they know what they're doing. And you think that what they're doing is making so you remember the product name, so you go to the store and you're buying laundry detergent and you, how many million ads you've seen for Sudzo soap, and so you go, oh, Sudzo, I want to buy Sudzo. That's not what they're doing with these ads. They're trying to create, they're trying to affect your consumption at home while you're watching these ads so that you'll have to buy more tomorrow. They're trying to affect your consumption now, so you need more tomorrow of all these different things they're selling. So, because they know they can do it. And so, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, uh, let's not all be naive as a field to think that we're the only ones doing this kind of research, and so we're you know, giving the game away to advertisers. No, they have huge amounts of money for research and development, and 60-something billion dollars is spent on advertising in, uh, worldwide, maybe it's just the U.S., each year. And they're not spending that money for nothing. They're, they're spending that money because it works, and it does work. And um, I think they know this already. Uh, we, we've been demonstrating it because uh, we suspect that's what they were up to. That's a real-world application of the idea of priming. Uh, people who are trying to lose weight or whatever are, are not uh, helped by this at all. Uh, but, you know, what are you going to do? Food ads. But it's the way they do the ads is uh, causing this a uh, additional consumption. You get the same thing with smoking, and, and I hate to say it, but you get the same thing with non-smoking, anti-smoking ads because they're full of cues to smoking. They're talking about the word smoking, they're, they're showing cigarettes, they're showing cues to smoking. We've already done that study. Anti-smoking, non-smoking ads increases smoking in our participants. We give them a chance to have a break and come back for the rest of the experiment. Break is a code word, as many of you may know, for having a smoke if you uh, haven't had one and you're a smoker. And we let them go, they go outside and they smoke. And we can actually see them from our lab um, window in the courtyard doing that. Priming effects, contextual priming effects who you vote for 
or what you vote for. It affects outcomes of election. This is a, a Jonah Berger study at Stanford. Uh, uh, now he's at Wharton School. But what they showed was that, uh, I think this was done with Christian Wheeler. This is a great paper. Um, if you vote in a school, you're more likely to vote for school-related issues like bond issues. If your precinct happens to be in a school, and that's, you know, it's, it just happens your voting booth is in a school, like a gym. Or in many places uh, in the South uh, uh, and maybe other parts of the country, people vote in churches. And if you vote in a church, people who vote in church are more, vo are more likely to vote in line with religious and church positions. You know that by looking at the precincts, and you can look at the actual vote. You know, it's public record. You can see at these different precincts, was it at a school, was it at a church, and how people voted, even in the same community, you get these kinds of differences. So priming is not just laboratory little uh, tricks. This is uh, something that happens out there and really affects people in important real-world decisions. Uh, and there's a wonderful uh, series of papers on the broken windows theory, which came out in sci science. This is a bunch of Dutch uh, researchers. Uh, and this is a really wonderful paper uh, showing that the cues to disorder or cues to graffiti or cues to uh, vandalism, that kind of thing, uh, here are the two conditions. Uh, and this is actually, these aren't, these aren't the stimuli, these are the actual scenes where the uh, settings in the actual environment in Holland where they collected the data. If, for example, there's no graffiti on the wall, now what they did was they put little flyers on, on all the bikes. You see those pieces of paper that the experimenters put those on there, like little ads or something or announcements of a, a dance or a concert. And they just wanted to see how many people took it and dumped it on the ground. And if there was no graffiti there, very few people uh, took those things and dumped them on the ground. If there was graffiti on the wall, significantly more people took those things and dumped them on the ground. And that's the whole idea behind broken windows theory, is that uh, these cues we're seeing out there are setting norms. They're telling us, just like that little kid following the two adults, what is the right thing or appropriate or okay thing to do here or not? And we're very sensitive to what other people do. They have this in a variety of different uh, demonstrations. Uh, so, so, you know, priming effects or what, what's going on, how you perceive how other people are behaving in your world is a very strong influence on what you do yourself. And it has social implications.